Welcome to study of this Sunday's Bible readings. We'll study the three readings for this Sunday, starting with the gospel reading, followed by the first reading from Isaiah in the Old Testament, and then the second reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that as we come before you and come together once again to study your word, we thank you, Lord, that your word is truth and it is light. And we thank you, Lord, that we're going to study about that light tonight. We're going to study about who your son Jesus Christ was and who he is in our midst. And we thank you, Lord, that as we study it, that it will be an important part of our walk with you as we leave this lesson tonight. We thank you, Lord, for it. We receive it in thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Our gospel reading for this Sunday is from the Gospel of John. Well, most gospel readings for this year will be from Matthew from time to time as it fits in the sequential narrative of the ministry of Jesus. Readings will come from John's gospel. On our Bible timeline, we can see that this, the events of the gospel were around 25 AD. Here's some background of John's gospel. Written by the Apostle John when he was an old man late in the first century, apparently after he relocated to Ephesus after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. All the other gospels and epistles of the New Testament had already been written. It is unique from the other gospels as it tells the story of the Messiah from a different perspective. John tells us why he wrote it in chapter 20. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Whereas the other Gospels speak to different audiences with different perspectives, John speaks to all mankind regarding the regenerated life and life in abundance, as he says in chapter 10, verse 10, that the Messiah has brought to us. This means that life should be exciting, compelling, fulfilling, satisfying. The gospel reading from John this Sunday starts at verse 29. The reading itself describes the second part of the epiphany, meaning to reveal, that I mentioned last week. The first part was when the magi, the wise men, came to pay homage to Jesus as being God incarnate, revealing Jesus as God incarnate in the role as king prophesied centuries earlier, born in the world just as all humans are. That was last week's gospel. This Sunday, John the Baptist fulfills the second part of the epiphany by revealing Jesus as the Son of God. In order to gather the full meaning of the gospel reading, it's important to grasp the verses previous to the reading to get the full impact of what John the Baptist says and does regarding Jesus. So we'll start with verse 1 and lead up to the gospel reading. John chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So this begins John's 18-verse introduction about Jesus, who Jesus really is. Why is he the most written about person to ever live? That is what John is answering. And he tells us right away, Jesus is God. He's referring to Jesus as the word. And we'll talk about that in a little bit here. He says, Jesus is the creator. All things came into being through him. And he says that he is the originator of all things. Without him, not one thing came into being. The first five verses parallel the first book of Genesis. The first five verses parallel the book of Genesis, the chapter one, the beginning of the entire Bible. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, 
and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the parallel here, verse 1 of John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, Genesis 1, in the beginning, God. Verse 2, he was the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him. Then it says in verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters in Genesis verse 2 is parallel to all things being made through Jesus. And in Genesis, the word God is the Hebrew word Elohim. It's the plural form of the root word for God. In verse 26, in fact, where God creates man, it doesn't say God said, I will make man in my own image. It says God said, let us make man in our own image. Again, using the plural form. We refer to the Trinity in our studies. And that's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Trinity means tri-unity, three in one. Then continuing with the parallel, verse 3 of Genesis, chapter 1, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light and that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. So here we see, in him was life, and the life was the light of the people. Verse 3 of Genesis 1, God said, let there be light. And verse 5, the light shines in the darkness. Verse 4, Genesis 1, and God saw the light that it was good and divided the light from the darkness. So why did he say Jesus was the word? Well, words are the only way that we can communicate what we're thinking. Our thoughts remain ours until we form words to express them. We only know what God is thinking when we hear or read his words. So Elohim said it, and it happened. And just as words become expressions of God's thinking, thus Jesus becomes the thoughts of God made flesh, exemplifying how a man should walk as the image of God. And Jesus became the living word of God expressing God's thinking through the words that Jesus said. That's why our words are so important. God just did not think a thing, and it came to pass. He first thought, then he said it, and it became. That's also what separates us humans from other living things on the earth. As the living image of God, we are able to convert our thoughts into words that communicate meaning to the hearer. When we pray, it's the words that we use that we put into meaning what we are praying for. We are thinking about what to pray for, and we express it in words, and it's the words that are the spiritual containers that put out into, into, the, into the air that which we are believing for. How do we know Jesus as the Son always existed? He was in the beginning with God, as verse 2, John 1 says. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. He is separate and distinct. As verse 1 says, the word was with God. But he and the Father are one also. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. And yet they are the same. The word was God, as verse 1 says in the John's Gospel. Now, the thing that's interesting is Jehovah's Witnesses and Unitarians are two of the denominations that don't believe Jesus was God. But here in the Gospel, John is telling us that he was. can also be compared to marriage. So I, I kind of see it. We say husband and wife become one. And then in the marriage vows, it says, let no man split asunder. They're still two separate people, but they are one in the spirit. It's Jesus, the son, and in him all things hold together, as Paul's letter to the Colossians says, chapter 1, verse 17. And he sustains all things by his powerful word, 
as Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says. Jesus and the word are inseparable. Verse 5 gives us the first hint of the struggle between belief and unbelief. The world is in darkness. The spread of violence, sexual permissiveness, adultery, drug abuse, gross materialism are leading to the fall of civilization as we know it. Mankind's achievements are meaningless without the light of Elohim. Ultimately, everyone understands there is a void in their life and it takes Elohim to fill it. And the words at the end of verse 5, and that darkness has not overcome it, more literally means to lay hold of or take possession. The world's darkness could not overcome or become more powerful than the light. What did Jesus originate? Life and light. Light is the ability to understand who we are in Christ. How do we know Jesus as the Son always existed? He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. Then the gospel continues at verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. So it tells us that witness that was necessary was John. Now, this is not the John who is writing the gospel. The gospel writer is the apostle John who will follow Jesus during his ministry, be one of the 12 apostles. The John he is talking about here is John the Baptist, who is the cousin of Jesus. John the Baptist is the son of Elizabeth and the son of Zechariah, we see early in the, in the Gospel of Luke. John instructed the world in a fundamental way to be able to accept and lay hold of the light of the world. His elementary instructions were, first, admit your need. Admit that you're in darkness. You're lost, confused, cannot solve your own problems. Then, the second thing is believe in Jesus. Believe in the one who gives life the one who meets you where you are and brings you light and life. And the third thing is to repent. Correct your behavior. Repent literally means to turn around, change your ways, do things different than the way you've been doing them. Then verse 9. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. So we're, here we have, as John's gospel continues, a summary of who Jesus is and was coming into the world, that he became the light personified. The light took on flesh and lived among us. The darkness obscured the light that he re represented. His own community, his own people in Nazareth, the world Jesus was raised in, did not recognize or believe that he was the Messiah that God, that God had promised. In Luke 4, 16, it tells us that Jesus stood up in the synagogue to read from the scriptures, and he read the prophecy that the Messiah would come. And then Jesus said, this prophecy, the prophecy that he had just read, was fulfilled in their ears right before them. He basically said, I'm the Messiah you've been waiting for. And their response was, oh, no, you're not, and tried to kill him. As we see the Jews not believing he's the Messiah, we wonder how it will be viewed by Jews and Christians when he, when he returns. The one, for the first time, the Jews, it'll be the first time they see the Messiah. And the other, for the second time, as Christians see the Messiah return. Zechariah gives us an interesting prophecy in Zechariah 13, 6, where he says, And if anyone asks, what are these wounds on your hands? The answer will be, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. Verse 12. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, 
nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The word power here, it's the Greek word exousia. It's the ability to make a choice. Not the word used in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, which is the Greek word dynamis, the ability to hold the worlds together supernaturally. There it says the power of God. Here it's the power of a person to make a decision. So we become the children of God, not by man, but by God through the rebirth that must occur, that one must be born again, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. Jesus tells Nicodemus this in John's Gospel, chapter 3. That's why other denominations have altar calls. They recognize the need to make a choice. You have the power to make that decision. You exercise that power, the ability to make the choice and say what you believe and be born again to become a child of God. In our first birth, we became a child of a human. When we are born again through the Spirit, we become a child of God. We're born again through the power, the dynamis, supernatural ability of the Holy Spirit that makes this happen. In verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only son from the father. John bore witness to him and cried, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. So here we have John telling us who Jesus really is. Here we start with who Jesus was visibly on the earth when he came. John beheld, he actually experienced, he saw the glory of Jesus. The word dwelt here, dwelt among men, is in the Greek word skenu. It has a primary meaning to fix one's tabernacle, to have a tabernacle, have it live in the tent. That's what dwelt literally means. It relates to the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll be talking more about the Feast of Tabernacles during Easter time. But here he says he dwelt among us. He made his tabernacle with us. And just as Jesus Christ had the capacity to come into the world and dwell with us, God has given us the capacity for him to dwell in us. This belief that God came into the world as a human being is so fundamental that in his letter, John declares in his first letter, in the epistles, chapter 4, verse 3, that denying Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is the spirit of Antichrist. Compare that to what other religions believe about Jesus. Do they teach God was made flesh? That he lived among us? and that he, we can invite him to live in us. This is all unique to Christianity. John is saying he saw the glory of God in Jesus, much as a son is a reproduction of his father's appearance. The glory of God is grace and truth. What is grace? It's that which God does within you, without you. It is the generosity of God's love. As we label John the Baptist, Baptist is the from the actual original Greek word, baptismo, and it means immerse, literally means to immerse. So there are some translations that instead of saying John the Baptist, it's John the immerser, because that's literally what baptism means, to immerse. So John the immerser is then quoted in verse 15 as making it clear that even though Jesus' ministry came after John's began, Jesus was the final appearance in history of a glory that had been seen before John came. Where it says, he dwelt among us, the tabernacle that was part of the 40-year wandering in the desert where God resided was a shadow of the coming of Jesus to dwell among us, then to live in us. That tent that they carried around in the desert for 40 years was the image of God dwelling with mankind. And it was now God in the flesh that John is revealing, dwelling with his people, a living tabernacle or tent to dwell with the people. We continue verse 16. 
and from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. The law, as the law of Moses is referenced here, the law makes demands. It's hard and cold. It's like the tablets that they were written on. They're without mercy. Jesus is the channel of grace and truth. This is saying that the law makes demands, but the grace and truth of Jesus fulfills the demands. As it says in the scriptures, it's impossible to fulfill the law, but Jesus fulfills the demands that the law requires. God now offers a daily supply of love. It's as if the manna that God supplied to the Israelites in the desert was the foreshadowing of the daily love and grace that God is showering on us each day. We are cherished, protected, and blessed by God. He supplies it every day. It is his love that fulfills the law. He has made him known, as written here at the end of verse 18, is literally he has fully explained him. Later in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 9, we hear Jesus say, who has seen me has seen the Father. Then at verse 19, and as the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed. He did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then are you, Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So this group from Israel, they confront John with, who do you think you are? And John straight out says that he's not the Christ. Then they ask again. Some think that he is Elijah in the flesh, as referenced in Malachi verses 4, 5, and 6. But that view would support reincarnation. Reincarnation is not biblical. It's demonic, actually. But we know he comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. But we know from Luke chapter 1, verse 17, that he comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. He says he is not actually Elijah. Then they ask if he is the prophet. And that is referenced from Deuteronomy eighteen fifteen that the prophet would come to be heard. And he says, no, he is not the prophet. Then in verse 22, then they said to him then, who are you then? Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So they finally said to him, give us something we can take back to those who sent us. And John answers, he's the one crying in the desert, as Isaiah did. In fact, John the Baptist reads the prophecy himself and knows his role. He knew what the prophecy said. He says he is to prepare a highway in the desert for God, not to bring man to God, but God to man. So here he is quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. And the verse after this in Isaiah, verse 4, says, Every valley is raised up and every mountain brought down. This is how repentant works. The lowly are brought up. The exalted are made low. And at verse 24. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him then, why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know, even he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. So here John continues to clarify who he is compared to the one who comes after him, the one who is preparing the way for. Not only that, but the one who comes after him will be offering baptism with the Spirit of God, not just with water that John the Baptist is baptizing with. From this perspective, John knows the subservient nature of his ministry as compared not only to the ministry of Jesus, but the 
fact that John knows there will be more to life and death of Jesus than just Jesus' ministry. Then in verse 28, it says, This took place in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. So here's a map of the Holy Land. And here's Nazareth up here in the north, where Jesus is raised. And then Jerusalem down here to the south in the middle of Judea. And then the River Jordan flowing from north to south into the Dead Sea. Zooming into this section, we see then the position of Nazareth and Jerusalem. And uh, here is where here is where Bethany is near Jerusalem, only a couple miles away from Jerusalem. So the Bethany that we're familiar with in the Gospels, just east of Jerusalem. But there's another Bethany to the north, and so it's distinguished from the Bethany near Jerusalem by calling it Bethany beyond Jordan. It's just to the east of the Jordan River. This is where John the Baptist then is baptizing. Verse 29 then begins our gospel reading. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one of whom I said, A man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I did not know him, but the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. John testified further, saying, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from heaven and remain upon him. I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, On whomever you see the Spirit come down, and remain. He's the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. So John reveals Jesus in four facets. First, in verse 23, we saw earlier that he is the Messiah. John reveals himself as one fulfilling the prophet Isaiah to be the voice crying in the desert, to make straight the way of the Lord, the Messiah. So he tells us back in verse 23, that's who Jesus is. Then here in verse 29, it says he is the Lamb of God. After all the blood spilled and sacrifices throughout the centuries during Passover, after Isaac asks Abraham, where is the Lamb? And Abraham says, God will provide a Lamb it is finally revealed that Jesus is the Lamb of God to take away the sin and fulfill all the sacrifices of the Old Testament. It's something only God can do. Then the third thing, the third facet that John reveals Jesus about is that he is the one who will baptize or immerse us with the Spirit. John is emphasizing that he baptizes with the physical element of water that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. The cleaning with water on the outside cannot clean us on the inside. It's only something that God can do with his spirit. Then finally, in verse 34, the fourth facet, John flat out declares Jesus as the Son of God. So then we have the first reading from Isaiah chapter 49, and it's a prophecy of the start of Jesus' ministry which began at his baptism. It was written around 690 BC. So we're over 700 years before Jesus' ministry begins. And this is the first reading. Isaiah 49, verse 3. The Lord said to me, You are my servant, Israel, through whom I show my glory. Now the Lord has spoken, who formed me as his servant from the womb that Jacob may be brought back to him, and Israel gathered to him. And I am made glorious in the sight of the Lord, and my God is now my strength. It is too little, the Lord says, for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. 
So this passage, like much of this section of the book of Isaiah, is the Messiah himself speaking. Speaking prophecy through the prophet Isaiah, almost 700 years before Jesus is born. The glory of Jesus is shown through Israel and his service to humanity and is ordained from the womb. It also prophesies to be a light to the nations. And when the Old Testament refers to the nations, it's typically a reference to the Gentiles, which enables the salvation that Jesus offers through his sacrifice on the cross to the extent of the ends of the earth. This speaks to who Jesus is, just as the gospel reading does. And you can see from the reading that verse 4 is left out of the reading. And that verse says this. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity, yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with God. This verse is omitted perhaps because it does not sound like the Messiah. If this is the Messiah prophesying about himself, then it obviously shows a despair by the Messiah and that his service has been for nothing, has been in vain. But when looked at, the fact that Jesus was tempted in all things, as we see him on the cross, despairing that his father had left him. This can be a reference to that despair that he showed. And also, he most likely was even tempted with despair at other times during his ministry. Several times, Jesus is frustrated with how his own apostles respond. And in one instance, he even says, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? This verse is recorded in all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then the second reading is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. It was written around 55 AD. So we are some 30 years after Jesus starts his ministry, as described in the four Gospels. And after John the Baptist has identified Jesus as the Son of God and baptizes him, which begins Jesus' ministry. Paul, being a Jew and having rejected Jesus as the Messiah initially, is converted around 35 AD. So when Paul writes this letter, he's spent 20 years in the missionary field, starting churches and writing letters that bring the fundamental teachings of how what Jesus taught should be lived. From the map of Paul's missionary journeys, we see his travels to Corinth on both his second and third missionary journeys in green and blue. The book of Acts tells us that Paul established a church there around 50 AD. Toward the end of his second missionary journey after going to Athens. Corinth is a large city, much like any American city today. During Paul's time, Corinth is very prosperous and has a reputation for the reckless pursuit of pleasure, represented by many ethnic groups and is a center for government, business, the military, and sports. The main pagan worship centered around the goddess Aphrodite. The temple to Aphrodite was supported by 10,000 prostitutes who performed sexual acts as part of the pagan worship. Also, like modern America, Crime and sex was rampant. Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, which is described in Acts chapter 18. After completing his second journey around 51 AD, he begins his third journey around 52. He frequently stopped at the churches he had established over the 10 years of his journeys. So when he was in Ephesus during his first visit there during the third journey, some five years after establishing the church in Corinth, that he receives disturbing reports about the church of Corinth. They were full of pride and began excusing sexual immorality, not unlike Christians are today. The Corinthians were using spiritual gifts improperly and misunderstanding key Christian doctrines. So Paul writes this letter in an attempt to restore the Corinthian church to its proper foundation that of Jesus Christ. It is because of all the time spent in Corinth 
and the extent of the letters he wrote them, that we know more about the Christians in Corinth than any other church in the New Testament. The second reading starts at chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you can see this is all one sentence. And this is the entire second reading this coming Sunday. In it, Paul declares his credentials as an apostle in verse 1, and also sends greeting from Sosthenes, who may have been a church leader in Ephesus. In verse 2, the word church is the Greek word ecclesia. It's not a particularly religious word at the time. It literally means assembly and was commonly used for any gathering of the citizenry. So this Greek word back then could be used in reference to an assembly of a group of people who might decide on any matters of public interest. Consequently, Paul adds here the church of God, the assembly of God, distinguishing this gathering as being an assembly of God's people rather than any secular gathering. You can see then where the Denomination Assembly of God derives its name. In verse 2, here is one of those instances in the New Testament where Christians that are alive and are sanctified in Christ Jesus are called saints. The words inserted here by the translators to be are not in the original text. The believers in Corinth are called saints not called to be saints. According to Paul, anyone who is sanctified, that is, those who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior and call upon his name, do not need to be canonized by the church or be dead in order to be considered a saint. Then this reading ends at verse 3 with Paul's expression of grace and peace over the church of Corinth. So as I said, this is the entire second reading this Sunday and is only an introduction to the letter. This letter will be the source of second readings for the next seven Sundays. Verse 4 continues the letter. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind. Just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul starts, as he always did, with praising them for what they were doing right. Corinthian Christians had no problem with their basic tenets of their faith. In verse 5, it says the Christians were rich in word and knowledge. They relied on the teachings they had been given by Paul when he taught five years earlier. They did not have the New Testament, but they did have the prophecies of the Old Testament and the letters that Paul wrote. Then verse 7, because of their dedicated study and practice, they were lacking in no spiritual gift. Then continuing at verse 8. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So verse 8, they practice faith. They trust in the Lord without failing as they awaited Jesus' return. That is what the reference to the day of our Lord Jesus Christ is about. And they reference the day of the Lord, that was the return of Jesus. And verse 9, this is the key verse of the letter. What they lacked was the fellowship with the Lord that they needed to practice. They had everything going except the power of God released in their midst because they were being influenced by the city around them. They had the gifts, the knowledge, and the word, 
but they didn't have the power of God manifested. They were being influenced by secular beliefs, by the secular world around them in Corinth. Paul is going to call them out on this and implore them to get their walk with the Lord corrected. In these first nine verses of this letter, Paul mentions the name Jesus nine times, establishing what the cure is for carnality, getting their eyes off of self and on Jesus. Paul's praised them for what they're doing right, but he will spend most of the rest of the letter rebuking sin and correcting the error of their ways. How will he do this? Well, we'll have to wait until next week because the second reading picks up in this first letter to the Corinthians chapter 1 at verse 10. So Isaiah chapter 49 gives us a prophecy from the Messiah himself about what he will be when he is manifested in the world. The Gospel of John chapter 1 is that beautiful phrasing and description that John writes about Jesus Jesus being God, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then we have Paul's letter to the Corinthians, where we begin that letter this week and continue reading from it. So we have the prophet Isaiah and then the Gospel of John establishing for us the basic understanding of who the Messiah is, and then Paul's letter telling us what we as believers in the Messiah need to do to walk according to the Messiah's teachings. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. We give you the glory for this teaching. We thank you, Lord, that the gospel and the prophecies and the letters that Paul writes are so complete and helping us understand who you were as you were prophesied about, who you were when you walked the earth, and then who you are in us as it is explained in the letters of your apostles. We thank you, Lord, for this teaching. Thank you, Lord, that you filled us with your spirit. You filled us with your love and your mercy. So we receive this lesson. We receive all that you have to offer us. And we thank you, Lord, that you help us walk worthy of you, and help us walk properly according to your word. We receive it in thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.